very good evening to you and welcome to the most comprehensive bulletin in the country. This is certainly KTN Prime. Yes, we're very glad you could join us. Our sign language interpreter this evening is Meresha Oweti. And it's been a busy news day, hasn't Absolutely. it? And we do begin tonight with some unfolding drama in Parliament where a group of MPs are plotting to have Cabinet Secretary Anwai Guru sacked. MPs behind the motion filed by Gembe South Member of Parliament, Mithika Linturi, say they now have collected nearly 120 signatures backing this move. That's right. They accuse Waiguru of abusing her office by firing a government official through a text message. KTN's political editor Ben Kitili reports on the development that could point to new cracks in the Jubilee Coalition. The actual responsibility with regard to the budget is the county assembly. For the last one year, Ayan Waiguru has been the typical face of Uhuru Kenyatta's technocratic cabinet. But now she finds herself thrust in the middle of high-voltage jubilee politics. And it began when she fired Director General of the National Youth Service, Kipli Morogut, allegedly through a text message, replacing him with Nelson Gedinji. And now a group of MPs are seeking to have her kicked out of the cabinet, activating a clause in the Constitution for her removal, for what they call gross misconduct and gross violation of the Constitution. In a notice of motion filed by Gembe South MP Mithika Linturi that has been seen by KTN, the legislators have accused Waiguru of violating the law by abusing, intimidating and threatening public servants under her jurisdiction. The MPs have singled out Rugut's sacking as well as that of the former chairman of the Youth Enterprise Fund, Gor Semelango. On Monday, Linturi began the process of collecting signatures to support an impeachment motion. <laughs> Parliamentary sources close to the process have told KTN that by evening a total of 116 members of parliament had already signed up. That is more than the constitutional threshold of a quarter of the National Assembly members that is required for the motion to be admitted by the Speaker. The move comes amid what analysts see as simmering tension between the constituent parties of the Jubilee Alliance, URP and TNA. We elected the Honorable Uhuru Kenyatta because the respect and the loyalty we gave to Deputy President William Kipchirchi Samuel he needs to stand firm and understand that the Kalenjin community, the Nandi community, are complaining because their son, who has worked hard over 30 years to build a career, cannot be spoiled by just a lady by the name of Guru in one day. This latest debacle not only threatens the precariously delicate relationship between TNA and URP, but now puts the spotlight family on one of the most powerful figures in President Uhuru Kenyatta's cabinet. Ben Kitili, KTN. Very strong language used there, um, accusing a Waiguru of violating the law by, let's quote this, abusing, intimidating and threatening public servants. That's right. Of course, one of the big issues that's being brought up is that she actually sacked Kiplimo Ragut, who's the former Director General of the Natu uh, National Youth Service, mm -hmm. by text message, of yep. course, in contravention with the Constitution that does allow for fair hearing. That's Absolutely. the allegation. And our big question tonight, we're asking, do you support the motion to remove An Waiguru from office? Do you support the motion to remove An Waiguru from office? Yes, do share your opinion with us, and you can do that in many ways. You can send us an SMS, start with a yes or no, give us your comment, and send that to 22155. You can also tweet us at KTN Kenya, at Kachungira, and at Wilson underscore Mburu. We'll be looking at what you have to say later on in this bulletin. Let's turn now to a more familiar controversy, Anglo leasing. Former Attorney General Amos Wako is finally speaking on the saga and he's throwing the ball right back to his successor, Gidham Wigai. Professor Mwigai had accused Wako of having presided over the failures in defending the cases in international courts. But as Asha Mwilu now reports, Wako begs to differ. For weeks now, fingers have pointed in the direction of the Busia senator, who was credited with being Kenya's longest-serving attorney general, spanning two regimes. Emos Wako says his successor, Githum Wigai, has everything to do with the 1.63 billion shilling loss Kenya is about to incur over the Anglo-leasing contracts. In a statement sent from Geneva, 
He insists that anything that happened after his retirement in 2011 must fall squarely on Gidham Wigai, and therefore he should take responsibility. The patient died on the operating table a long time ago. Gidham Wigai is a mortician. If you think the patient should have lived, ask the surgeons. But the ever smiley Wako chose to send Shamuigai on his choice of words, saying, and I quote, Since he has referred to me as a surgeon, I want to say that I handed over as attorney general to a person I believed was a competent surgeon and not a mortician. This back and forth between the current and former attorney general stems from one fact. They both held the crucial state law office that is mandated to offer legal advice to the government. In this case, when the 18 Anglo leasing contracts were being signed, Amos Wako was the Attorney General and offered advice on each of those controversial contracts. Given Wigai, on the other hand, took over the defense of a case lodged in London by the owners of the Anglo leasing firms who wanted the government to pay for contracts that the government had already decided to cancel. The current Attorney General is now being accused of handling the cases casually. Wako advised cabinet ministers in both the Moi and the Kibaki regimes when they were authorizing the Anglo leasing deals. Gidham Wigai argues that Wako is now shifting that blame onto him. The chain of events in the Anglo contracts, however, leave both these men in an awkward position. Back in 2009, the Serious Fraud Office of the United Kingdom halted their investigations into the grand fraud, citing lack of evidence. Without uh, evidence from the Kenyan end, these uh, cases aren't going to go any further. And what the Serious Fraud Office have announced uh, yesterday is that, uh, with regret, they have had to terminate their investigation. Yes. According to the Law Society of Kenya, however, the 1.63 billion shilling payment to the Anglo leasing companies is the current AG's fault. We're just going for the Attorney General now on that account of the fact that he failed to defend a, def a case where we could have defended successfully. And now, the previously clear question of whether Kenya should or should not pay has degenerated into a court versus jubilee affair with fears that the real issues will be lost in the predictable partisan politics. Ashamwilu, KTN, Nairobi. No, if you live in Nairobi, you probably got caught up in the mayhem. We're talking about the chaos that paralyzed much of the cities today as students are routed over the proposal to raise their tuition fees. The riots have caused a lot of anger among motorists and shop owners, but as we will tell you in a few minutes, quite a bit of controversy too. Let's get the report from Wilkie Sanyabo. For a few hours on Tuesday, Nairobi's University Way turned into a battlefield. Students from the University of Nairobi had chosen this day to stage a demonstration that quickly turned chaotic, with police officers eventually called in to calm the rowdy mob that harassed motorists. <laughs> Similar scenes were witnessed at institutions of higher learning across the country. In Nakuru's Igaton University, the demonstration organized by students was cut short by police officers who lobbed tear gas canisters at students near the town campus. <laughs> students at Moi University in Eldoret marched from the main campus to Chepturet Shopping Center 15 kilometers away and tried to block the Eldoret Nakuru Highway with stones. They too were turned back by police officers. In solidarity, the students from various institutions of higher learning took to the streets, protesting plans to raise their fees and lower the maximum amount to be allocated to government-funded students by the Higher Education Loans Board. We will not negotiate with anybody. Yeah. The fee is either reduced or it remains where it is. As, as per now, if you can check the completion rate of students in university, it's dropping at a very terrific speed. The reason being, people cannot clear fees in time. Most people are deferring to go and look for other money somewhere to come and clear education. The students called for the resignation of Education Cabinet Secretary Professor Jacob Kaimeni, but Kaimeni has distanced himself from plans to raise university fees. 
After a full day of demonstrations, the students returned to their hostels, but the dispute is yet to be resolved. Wilkinson Abwa, KTN. Now, a lot of controversy after that um, mayhem in town because of an image that surfaced earlier on on Twitter um, about an, an image, that, the image you're seeing now on our video wall here about this particular man who's holding a panga. That's right. Now, the person who tweeted this picture said this was someone who was participating in the riots. But I refer now to a tweet from the Sonu chair, Babu Owino, who says that this is a police officer. So there's a bit of controversy here. Some people are saying, you know, are these students who are carrying on in this manner? Are they goons who are taking advantage of the situation? Or as Babu Wino is saying, is that a police officer? But you know, there, there was a warning sent out by Babu Wino uh, last night or yesterday when they were giving the press conference and warning that they are going to be uh, holding demonstrations today. He said that people should be very careful about the demonstrations because um, there might be elements, criminal elements, uh, who will inf might infiltrate the demonstrations to try and loot and stone motorists. Well, I guess that question still remains. Who are these people? Of course, we'll be following that very closely. Let's now go to Mandera where the number of police officers killed by the Al-Shabaab in yesterday's attack has now been confirmed as eight. Six other policemen are still nursing serious injuries sustained in the ambush. And as KTN's Habiba Ali now reports, it was a double tragedy for Mandera County as three other people died from inter-clan fighting in the area. The Kenya Red Cross Society says they have confirmed that eight police officers died in the ambush by the Al-Shabaab at Arabia in Mandera. Another six officers are fighting for their lives in a Mandera hospital. When they were ambushed, the officers were on their way to rescue drivers of four pickup trucks hijacked by the Al-Shabaab. For Mandera County, this latest incident complicates a security station already made trance by tribal clashes between two large clans. From tribal clashes alone, the death so far is 13, all killed in the month of May. In the 13th of May this month, three people were killed at Malbe near Burmayo at the border of Mandera and Wajia. On the 15th, five people were killed at Tofiq, some two kilometers from Ramo town. Five people sustained serious injuries in the same incident. On the 16th, two people lost their lives at Gunana. Then this Monday, the 19th of May, three people were killed at Bolole in Takaba, Mandera West. Three children suffered serious injuries. The victims of the latest incident were airlifted to Nairobi and are currently recovering at a Nairobi hospital. The conflict between the two clans has escalated in cycles since 1984. The inter-clan conflict is usually about pasture and water. Habiba Ali, KTN. Well, the question that comes from this is just what is the problem in Mandera, how can the attacks be so frequent? Our special projects editor, John Alan Namu, has been studying this region for over a year and has some insights into this seemingly endless conflict. The latest attack that has left eight officers dead in Mandera, if taken by itself, makes for yet another isolated incident in an insecure area. But taken in the context of the violence, it makes for scary analysis. The officers who were killed in Mandera were pursuing three land cruisers that the Al-Shabaab had stolen. That was after the Al-Shabaab had waylaid the Mandera County Commissioner on the way from a peace meeting, shooting and lobbing grenades at his convoy. It appears that the Al-Shabaab in the region are taking advantage of instability and stop-start clan conflicts that have been going on in the region for over a year now. But because they are not the only ones with weaponry, Distinguishing what fight the government should intervene in is difficult. And as witnessed yesterday, it can also be deadly. Last year, we reported on the existence of two well-funded militias backed by the Gare and the Degodia clans. The firefighting that has kept the county government busy there makes it simpler for the Al-Shabaab to hit at the government and melt away across the border. And they have done so regularly across the northeastern region. 
Just two weeks before this attack, a power station in Wajir was bombed by suspected Shabab adherents. Of the almost 100 terror attacks perpetrated in Kenya since October 2011, over 40 have been perpetrated in the northeastern region alone. It would appear that the Al Shabab is not facing as much resistance as it should on that front, but a political hand in clan fighting has not helped either. Some quarters have accused the county government of partiality in this fighting, an accusation that could just as easily be pinned on the other side. The government and the aid and the government. Last year, we asked President Kenyatta what was being done about the fighting in the region. Where we are now is a situation where we have made it abundantly clear that if, 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 if this doesn't stop, uh, we are going to have to be forced to take some very drastic measures. But confronted by trouble in the capital, it would appear that the government's long talk on resolving this complicated crisis has fallen short of decisive action. John Allen Amu, KTN. Now the devolution coming to Secretary Anwar Guru is in hot soup. The members of parliament are accusing her of abusing office and violating the constitution for, among other things, um, dismissing Kiplima Rugut uh, from, uh, via text message rather. That's right. And the question we're asking you on our big queue tonight, do you support that motion to remove Anne Waiguru from office? Already a lot of signatures taken to that. Do you agree with that? And you can let us know by tweeting us at KTN Kenya, at Kachungira and at Wilson underscore Buru. Or you can send us a text message on 22155. Begin with a yes or a no. Leave a small comment. And of course, we'll look at a poll result towards the tail end of this bulletin. As for now, take a short break, but don't you go away. We have much more after that. Just ahead, now go forth and shine. Academy polishes youth talents. There's a lot of insecurity. This effort should be directed to the Al-Shabaab, to the criminal people, not to be directed to the innocent souls, these young souls, these students. These people are just trying to look for their fortune in future. Where do this, this government want people to go? Should we run out of this country to go where? You're watching KTN Prime. Welcome back. You're watching KTN Prime. Unfortunately, we return from the break with some breaking news of an unfortunate nature. One person has been killed in a grenade explosion outside a mosque in Garissa town. Absolutely. And there was another grenade which was thrown outside a Sh uh, Shrunk's hotel which after, uh, failed to explode. Uh, one person has been killed in outside a mosque and another grenade which was thrown outside the Shrunk's hotel failed to explode. We'll of course continue to update you on the details of this story as we continue to get them. Let's now shift gears and the government says it will scrutinize every sports federation's account to ensure accountability in the usage of funds. Sports Cabinet Secretary Dr. Hassan Wario gave the notice at the graduation of 200 outstanding youth from the National Youth Talent Academy. A journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step, so the saying goes that summarizes the far this pioneering group of talented and dedicated youths who graduated from the National Youth Talent Academy on Tuesday. It all started with youth coaches counting for talent from the 47 counties. They have been prepared and trained in these areas in the interest and now ready to showcase their talents. We are in line with the Kenyan Fish in 2030, the Jubilee Manifesto and the Sports Act 2013. NIDA is the front runner of the Kenya Academy of Sports. To all the graduates, thank you for your cooperation. With focus now shifting to the progress of the graduates, the new recruits will now be able to access all information needed from the new academy website. Sports and Culture Cabinet Secretary Dr. Hassan Wario, who officiated the graduation, put federations on notice of affairs that inject negative energy to talented boys and girls while denying their rights for progression. The 70 federations, you are going to register anew by this August. We are going to check all your accounts. Make sure that money goes to the sport that you said you are supporting. Now, the trainers have used opportunities during the training to inculcate values 
that have significantly contributed to national integration, peace education, and prevention of illnesses like HIV among young people in this country. The academy seeks to, besides nurture talent, allow students to infuse academics and the extracurricular activities. Nicholas Mudimbakate in Prime. Now, it's a busy day for Dr. Hassan Wario from that particular event. He's in the studio with me now, and we're going to be talking about some of the activities that he's getting involved in. Thank you very much for coming this Thank evening. You. Thank you for having me. Now, you graduated over 200 people this afternoon. What is, what is the vision uh, for the National Talent Academy? The vision for the National Talent Academy is simple. Uh, focus on the youth who are 70% of our population. Uh, focus on their creativity, tap that, channel it, and you'll get results. Mm -hmm. So we started that a couple of years ago, and it's been growing from strength to strength. And I'm really encouraged to, uh, to hear one of our success stories is right here in the studio. Ah, well, fantastic. One of your cameramen. Oh. Yes. Oh, that's, that's, that's fantastic. Yeah, so what we're doing is uh, offering youth who are talented from different parts of the counties uh, to come um, at a central point, which we call the National Youth uh, Talent Academy, which has been very greatly funded by UNICEF over the years. Right. Um, and uh, train them. So if you're good in film, we train you in film. If you're good in sports, whether it's football, basketball, rugby, uh, it is part of the, uh, our vision to tap into talent and make talent pay for you. Okay. Yeah. And I'm sure this is fitting into a, a broader vision you have uh, in your docket. Uh, as uh, Cabinet Secretary for Sports, Culture and the Arts. Let's talk a little bit about something else you're doing. That's the Smithsonian Folklife Festival that's going to be happening in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. June and July. Yeah. Why have you gotten Kenya involved in that? This happened uh, before me, but I was at the museum at that time. So, more or less, the then uh, Minister of Heritage uh, visited the Smithsonian Festival, I think uh, about two, three years ago. And uh, a deal was struck to have Kenya uh, go to the Folklife Festival uh, in 2014. So when I came into office, I inherited that. Uh, but it is, a, it is a very important thing to showcase Kenya uh, at a place where during summer you get about 1.7 million to about 2 million diverse visitors from all over the world uh, on the mall. And we, we're going to have the best part of the mall, uh, the two countries uh, presented there this year, it's Kenya and China, but we are the focal point, so slightly we're given a chance to be bigger and, mm -hmm. and to be more visible. Right, yeah. it, it sounds great, and um, I think the theme you're going with is Kenya Mambo Po, is that right? Yes. Well, a lot of people may say that considering the situation we have with security and the, and the state of uh, tourism, that maybe it's not such a situation of Kenya Mambo Po. I mean, uh, international arrivals have gone down 11.2%. Earnings from tourism have fallen consistently over the last three years. So is this a case of fetching water with a leaking vessel? Is this going to be enough to sort of revive the situation we have? No, I think uh, when we made that slogan, Kenya Mambo Poa, we first wanted a funky, vibrant, you know, um, uh, kind of message and very youthful. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't say Mambo ni Mazuri, we said Mambo Poa, Poa. deliberate. It's very much uh, the, the kind of language you hear on the streets. Uh, it represents Kenya now in the going towards 51 years and into the next 50 years. Uh, but it's, no, it's more apt now, it's more important now that uh, when we go there, we're reaffirming. Uh, the fact that Kenya is a peaceful country. Uh, this, these challenges we have, they're, they're bigger in other countries. Okay? Uh, and you don't get advisories like they, they, they've given us. Terrorists hit anywhere. And if we give in to them, uh, it means we, you know, they, they, they will be the victors because their whole aim is to sell terror, mm -hmm. to terrify people. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, our security forces are on top of the game. Um, uh, and I think Kenya Mambo Poa then reaffirms uh, that uh, fact. Uh, and w where else in, in Washington right. tells you that things are okay in Kenya and we'll be showcasing uh, the best of this country in terms of culture, uh, in, in terms of creativity, uh, in terms of uh, the credit of humankind, that this is where we all came from. So what, what kind of activities are you going to be involved in? Uh, I've touched on, on, on that. So we'll have the credit of humankind uh, and um, let me mention that about eight museums uh, or Smithsonian museums, these are their national museums, the big ones, will be showcasing Kenya at the same time. 
So we'll have criminal mankind, and prominent there will be the Turkana boy, which is the uh, almost the, the most complete uh, fossil record you can find anywhere in the world, uh, uh, which will take the pride of place. We'll also have something on people and the environment, uh, at the center of which we will have this big sculpture by Kenya's celebrated uh, sculptor uh, Elkana Ongesa. Uh, and, and that will be keep off our elephants, so it will have a conservation theme to it. And then we'll have creativity. So there'll be music, dance, but also right. things that are made from recycled materials. Okay. Yes. And last thing, I'm a Kenyan, perhaps I'm an artist, I'm a sculptor. How do I get involved? What's in this for me? Uh, slightly too late, I've, but we have engaged many Kenyans before. Uh, I think we, we're closing the list now. Uh, we've reached our target of 80 people who are going to be sponsored by the government. And then uh, a lot of enthusiasm and support and interest from the counties. So well done, counties. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we're taking about uh, 200 more uh, from the county upwards. Uh, right. and, uh, not 200. Uh, we're going to up to 120, sorry. Um, I think that's our maximum. But what we're saying is, let's go there and see, mm -hmm. represent Kenya. Right. And the most important part of, of the, all this is also the diaspora. Yes. To whom we have sold the message. Right. Uh, we walked from places to places. Yes. In, in, in when we were I think in I, I met you in... in Minnesota. Eh? Yes. Yes. Uh, so, <laughs> it's a small world. So it is also for the diaspora. And okay. To bring the children and the families and, and see a uh, piece of home. Right. Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming this evening. Thank you. And uh, we certainly wish you all the best in, you know, putting some more, some different rhetoric about Kenya. Yes, okay. and Kenya Mambo Po. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. That was uh, definitely the Cabinet Secretary in the Ministry for Sports, Culture and the Arts, Dr. Hassan Wario. Well, we now head over to our business studio where Bonnie Tunya is standing by and he's got all the latest. Good evening to you, Bonnie. How are you doing? Very well, but the business news is not so good because we have a falling shilling in a case of one budget and two supplementary budget statements. Stay tuned. My name is Bonnie Tunya and this is KTN Business. Now, Kenya is faced with unprecedented budget scare. Treasury, we have learned, has prepared two supplementary budgets as options for raising the extra cash needed to fund the record 1.8 trillion shilling budget. Here's KTN's business editor, Joseph Bonyo, with the rest of that report. Presented to the National Assembly last month, National Treasury Cabinet Secretary Henry Rotich factored in the proceeds of the planned sovereign bond estimated at 174 billion Kenya shillings. However, uncertainties around the planned issuance of the bond is leaving the National Treasury with very limited options in the event that it flops. The euro bond will be critical in meeting Kenya's debt obligations and with challenges, Treasury has already put in a plan B. This desperation was witnessed last week when President Uhuru Kenyatta issued a directive to the Treasury to pay the contentious 1.4 billion shillings to the Anglo leasing related companies. With less than two months to go before the end of the financial year, the choice was either to start cutting back on government expenditure, to start cutting back on programs and service delivery to Kenyans, or to pay in order for us to be able to move forward as a country. In the 2014-2015 financial year budget, Kenya is staring at over 300 billion shillings budget shortfall. Therefore, the sovereign bond is an integral part of meeting this record budget. The bond is also intended to diversify funding sources and cut domestic interest rates since the government will reduce its focus on local sourcing or financing. Sources further add that plans had already been put in motion to cut national spending to accommodate the 174 billion shilling gap just in case the sovereign bond flotation is delayed or flops. Analysts contend that Kenya has to float the bond as the consequences of not doing so could be dire to the economy, mainly due to the expected crowding of the private sector from the local debt market. Treasury has been planning the bond for more than a year now, but it has been delayed for a variety of reasons, ranging from unfavorable international financial conditions and amendments to the Public Financial Management Act. The consequences of the delay are first manifesting, with the recent announcement that the government had secured a three-month extension on a 52 billion shilling debt owed to three international banks. The extension will see taxpayers part with an additional 500 million shillings as a cost to save government from embarrassment of defaulting its debt obligation to Citibank, Standard Chartered Bank UK, and Standard Bank of South Africa. 
Now you can get more analysis on that report on tomorrow's copy of the standard. Now in, is Kenya's tourism new uh, is Kenya's new tourism direction uh, seeking alternative source markets a winning strategy for an industry nearly crippled? KTN Michael Karanja explores. With a 12% contribution to Kenya's GDP, tourism remains a key pillar to the country's economy. Famed for its sun, sun and the big five, Kenya's tourism sector receives accolades world over. But this is no longer the case. The high profile it has attracted over the years is fast fading as insecurity takes a toll on the sector. This has been on the basis of travel advisories that have seen key source markets warn their citizens on traveling to Africa's third leading tourism destination. If we lose that uh, market uh, going into the high season, then uh, we are faced with a situation whereby we will have to make very, very tough decisions in the industry uh, that will lead to massive job losses. So uh, we do really need to address the issue. And the heat is not only being felt by the industry players, but also within government ranks. Mimi nasema ya kwamba Kenya hii hakuna pahali sisi tunayanda. Waende, watali wetu watakuwa hapa hapa. Tututasaidiana hapa, watu watembe, tutafute inchi zingine. Wasifikiria kwamba ni mambo ya kutisha wale wengine. Currently, the United Kingdom accounts for 34% of international arrivals in favor of emerging markets. But the government seems to have made up its mind to look elsewhere for tourists. Cabinet Secretary Phyllis Kandia is expected to lead a delegation to China in the coming days to woo tourists. This, the state expects, will offer a relief to an already fragile market. Upon return, she will head west to Nigeria for a similar venture. But industry players fear that this might be an ill-advised venture. You have to look at uh, the, the markets that you want to enter. Uh, have we conducted enough research? Uh, do we know uh, the patterns of, of uh, travel uh, from that end? And uh, uh, we do need a little more information before you venture into new markets. More disturbing for the sector is 11.3% drop in arrivals last year, while earnings for the third year in a row fell to 93 billion shillings. Michael Karanja, KTN Business. The Kenyan shilling today found temporary relief from the dollar even as Annis insists that the 18-month low it sunk is, to, is not associated with threats of terrorism. KTN's Charles Gitonga with the details. Dividend payouts by locally based firms to foreign shareholders is the underlying reason for the weakening of the shilling. The payouts are said to have caused excess liquidity in the market, making the shilling lose ground against the dollar. This is a phenomenon we see every May. If you, come, if you look at uh, May 2013, we also depreciated by uh, about, I'd say about 2.5%. On the other hand, appetite for the U.S. currency by manufacturers and bankers is said to further weaken the shilling. This is amid maturity of various bills and bonds, which is seeing more money get back to circulation simultaneously. We've had very heavy uh, maturities in uh, the first half of, of this year, um, which is always which is always serves to weaken the shilling. So um, that has been one of the causes of depreciation. The Central Bank of Kenya has been required to frequently intervene by mopping up excess liquidity in rescue for the shilling. In yesterday's trading, the bank removed 2 billion shillings from circulation and analysts reckon this must be a regular exercise if the currency is to stabilize. That has served a very big part in stabilizing the shilling. If, if they're not in the market, it would be a lot higher now. Tourism is also said to shock the market as investors remain jittery of the security situation in the country. Tourism, which is a main foreign exchange, Anna is worst hit, therefore denying Kenya the golden chance to harvest dollars. The biggest aspect is because tourism is hard currency. So, of course, there will be a slight effect. With analysts fearing that the shilling might hit the 88 shillings and 50 cents psychological mark to the dollar in the coming days, the ray of hope shines at the 20 billion two year bond auction next week. However, Kenya's high current account deficit, coupled with high borrowing to finance the capital intensive projects, analysts add will continue to hurt the currency going forward. Charles Gitonga, KTN Business. All right, so that's an 18-month sink by the Kenyan shilling, but here's how I look at how it performed today. 
Let's recap our top story for you now. A group of MPs are plotting to have Cabinet Secretary Anwai Guru sacked. MPs behind the motion filed by Igembe South MP Mithika Linturi say that they've now collected nearly 120 signatures that are backing the move. They accuse White Guru of abusing her office by firing a government official through text message, a development that could point to new cracks in the Jubilee Coalition. And in Kitengela, the former leader of the Mungiki sect, Mainan Jenga, has been speaking to us today about those graves and the bodies that were found there. Mainan Jenga, who has been facing suspicion from some residents, now says someone tried to burn his church last night. Ian Waffle we'll reports on the confusion and why residents are too scared to speak about the killings. This is the second grave in which the seventh body was exhumed from yesterday and up to now you can still smell the stench. When you take a walk around this piece of land, you realize that there are a lot of activities that have been taking place. Activities that are leaving more questions than answers. Just a few meters from the grave, we come across pieces of what were once computer parts. It was not certain who had dumped them at the site or even why. But one thing was clear. Anything and anyone could make way to this piece of land that has since become the center of Kitengela's troubles. Even as business goes on as usual, the tension within the town is evident with a number of theories over the recent cases of insecurity. But no one is willing to speak out. So secretly, we mic'd ourselves and walked along the streets as our camera person followed us close by. We came across these motorbike operators. Conversation was smooth until we raised the question on the piece of land and the recent deaths within the area. Silence. By this time of the day, word had gone round that the Hope International Church, associated with the former Mungiki sect leader, Mainan Jenga, had been burnt down to ashes. But Mainan Jenga points fingers towards a rather unlikely culprit in the attempted burning of his church, Al-Shabaab. In this country, we need a lot of peace. And uh, the peace that uh, we have earned for many years, we are supposed to stay with peace. Nobody is fighting each other. Even it is a criminal. You have to deal with that person like a criminal. But there is one more theory about the horror killings. Some of the residents who declined to speak on camera claim that the bodies could belong to a group of worshippers who they say had come to the church a few days ago but never came out. Claims dismissed by the former Mungiki leader. I don't have any information of any member who came to my church and later got any problem on the way. Because uh, I have... Uh, many pastors who are under me and these pastors have not reported any matter to me on monday kajiado senator peter mositet vaguely pointed fingers at a church in the area over the mystery killings let it be investigated and we should not allow people to come there uh, you know just uh, in pretense that they are worshiping and then the entire town is not peaceful yes doesn't have any evidence he's just talking for the sake of talking no, we do not like people who talk for the sake of talking. Uh, he must be very serious with what he, he is saying. That is a very grievous allegation whereby he's talking to the public. And uh, I would say that is like uh, inciting. The bodies are currently at the city mortuary and will have to wait full identification by families before the post-mortem examinations can begin. Ian Wafula, KTN. Well, a very unfortunate turn of events there in Kitengela. We'll continue updating you as the reports continue to get to us. Now, let's switch gears. It's time for sports. Lynn Washira is in our sports studio. A very good evening to you, Lynn. Quick question. What's your prediction for Saturday's game? Big game, isn't it? Oh, yes. Very big. <laughs> but I think I will want, or rather, I will choose to uh, maybe not comment or maybe put my money on any team. Uh, and just say, I'm putting what? my money on Atletico Madrid. Let's um, just... I don't know. I think Atletico is going to pack the bus. I'm not really sure. But we're going to wait and see about that. But don't go away. Then Sports News is up next after a short break. 
Well, a very good evening and a warm welcome to KTN Sports. I'm Lynn Washira. Kenyan sprinters may not be among the favorites at the inaugural World Relays Championships in Bahamas, but representatives in the 4x200 meters and 4x400 meters team say that they are ready to state their case and leave a lasting mark. The world event is set for this weekend. Former 100 meters national champion Steven Barasa has been missing from the track for one year due to a groin injury. But his recovery coincided with the start of the national sprints and relays series, which culminated with the naming of the national team for the world event in Bahamas. Barasa is part of the 4x200 meters Kenyan team, and he says the world championships heralds a new chapter in his career. A big event for sprinters, and it's an opening. And I hope uh, the team that's going to represent uh, Kenya. The 4x4, the 4x2, it's going to be a big opening for the Kenyan sprinters, also for the future. His experience aside, he says the Kenyan team will not be heading to Bahamas for the sake of making to the start list. As a team, um, the team that has been selected to represent Kenya, so we'll be training hard for the, for the ladies. Defense forces Walter Moenga, Tony Chirchir and US-based Calvin Katanta will complete the Kenyan team. The 4x400 meters team, however, has a higher responsibility in Bahamas. The World Relays will act as a qualifier for the World Athletics Championships with all the eight finalists gaining automatic qualification. Our best foot is forward and uh, we're going to do our best. If our best is good enough, then we're sure I'm going to win. Boga says qualifying for the World Championships is a priority, but it's not all the team is focusing on. 400 meters Commonwealth champion Mark Mutai, Vincent Koskei, Boniface Musheru, and youngster Alex Ampao are the other Kenyans in the team that departs for Bahamas tomorrow. Well, it's time to wind up the bulletin tonight, but not before we give you the poll results of our big question tonight. We did ask you whether you think, uh, you support rather, the motion to impeach or to sack the devolution cabinet secretary Anne Waiguru and we're about to get the results. That's right. This is how you polled. We've got 79% saying yes. So that's an overwhelming majority. And only 21% saying no. Thank you very much for your feedback. I've got some SMSs here. This one says no. She's a very hardworking and a great performer. Those people who want to impeach should channel their energy to develop this nation. Wilson, you've got some tweets, haven't you? Um, Remy Nyongesa, who calls himself the freelance writer, says, yes, she should be sacked. She's behaving unprofessionally, and this is unacceptable in modern Kenya. Right. Uh, an agreement there from Edward Athumba from Mombasa, who says she made a very big, big mistake taking this country back to the days of the Nyayo era. In fact, she should have gone home yesterday. Um, Nkonsinathi Butelezi says, it's bad. Waiguru has thrown professionalism out the window. She's drunk with power. Big, uh, big shame. Hashtag BQ. Well, thank you very much for your comments and your opinions and for joining us for KTN Prime this evening. Our sign language interpreter was Marisha Owiti. I'm Nancy Kachingira. Have a good night. Wilson Buru, enjoy the rest of your viewing. Good night.